uh, burn a minute, just welcoming everyone back to this seminar. This is the last seminar of the uh, Center for Global Discovery and Conservation Science in the topic area of coastal marine science and management. I have a bit of a hoarse voice from traveling for the first time since uh, since the pandemic broke out and I got that that dry aircraft air voice today. So apologies for that. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I'm just gonna drag my feet a little more and say, just to let people come in and say that uh, this is the last seminar that we'll have uh, on this topic for now. We're gonna all break. I hope that you all will spend your summers exploring the planet and doing what you do. Uh, we'll be back in the fall, uh, probably on this topic, maybe, uh, pushing ourselves to connect land and sea in the fall is what I'm envisioning now. So uh, I'm really happy to end this part of our seminar series on a really strong note with uh, Dr. Tom Bell. And uh, Tom joins us. Tom, welcome. Uh, Tom's joining us as, a, as an assistant scientist in the Department of Applied Ocean Physics and Engineering at the Woods, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And uh, Tom uses a combination of field and laboratory techniques, along with remote sensing and st statistical models to investigate how physical and biotic factors impact the dynamics of foundation species and ecosystems ranging from kelp forests to seagrass meadows and coral reefs over large areas. So I'm super excited to, uh, to learn from Tom today. Um, before he got to Woods Hole, he did, uh, as far as I could tell, a tour of different California universities. Uh, I know he did his BA uh, in uh, integrative biology from Berkeley, uh, a master's in biology from uh, San Diego State, and then a PhD in marine science from UC Santa Barbara. So uh, did all of that in California and has done other postdoctoral work in California and Alaska all before getting to Woods Hole. Um, the title of his talk today is you can see it multi-scale approaches for reconciling competing mechanisms of ecosystem dynamics tom welcome and please take it away right thank you very much greg um so thank you all for inviting me into your homes today um it's a real pleasure to be able to tell you about my research um, and i like to start with this image showing the southern channel islands off the coast of california uh, to give you a sense of the spatial scales over which I work. And if you go to that most south island, uh, San Clemente Island, you can, if you squint, you can get, see a very faint ribbon of kelp along the, along the western edge, which you can see in this kind of green color. Okay. So I want to start my talk by posing this question. What drives the dynamics of coastal ecosystems? And there can be many drivers that shape these dynamics and they can act over you know, disparate space and time scales. And so one of these drivers is biotic interactions um, shown here as these parrotfish grazing on a coral reef. And another important uh, driver is physical disturbance. And so here you can see the carpentry salt marsh, um, which is just at the bottom of the hill from Montecito near Santa Barbara. And there was a very large debris flow following the Thomas fire in 2017, 2018. You can see the channels of this, of this salt marsh completely clogged with mud and snags and debris. Um, so we know that this can have a very large impact on these systems. And humans can also play a direct role in disturbance and habitat fragmentation, um, like these propeller scars you see here across the seagrass meadow. And so all these are examples of extrinsic drivers in that there's an, an external force that's acting upon the species or system of interest. But there can also be what we call intrinsic drivers of system dynamics or a force acting from within the organism of interest. And so one of these intrinsic drivers is senescence, um, which in plants um, or macroalgae, like you see here, is an irreversible decline in photosynthetic performance with age. And so these different colors of kelp fronds in this image are a good example of progressive senescence, where each frond has a lifespan of about 100 days. And as they age, they lose photosynthetic pigments in a predictable way, um, which we observe as a change in color. And it's important to understand what's driving the dynamics of these coastal ecosystems. Um, the majority of the world's population lives near the coast. 
And we depend on these systems for food, coastline protection, and as nursery habitats for many important fish, uh, fished and ecologically important species. So I'm an interdisciplinary scientist um, that works at the intersection of ecology, biogeography, physiology, and oceanography. Um, and I use optics and advanced image analysis techniques to try and answer this important question um, and how our understanding of these systems can lead to better human outcomes. So my research is generally motivated by trying to understand how the e extrinsic and intrinsic uh, forces drive the dynamics of marine ecosystems like kelp forests, seagrass meadows, and coral reefs, um, and getting into more salt marsh research now that I've moved on, moved over to the East Coast. Um, and one thing that these organisms have in common is that they're considered foundation species, um, in that they provide food and physical structure to a diverse assemblage of species that form the foundation of an ecosystem. And so today, I will tell a story about how we used a multi-skill approach to understand an important coastal, uh, coastal uh, foundation species more completely. And my story um, will focus on the kelp forests off California as I've done a lot of work in these systems over the past several years. Uh, and I aim to answer these three questions. What is the relative importance of extrinsic drivers of kelp dynamics? Um, can physiology help us understand kelp dynamics across multiple scales? And so here we'll use um, the physiological condition of kelp to gain insight into the intrinsic drivers of the system. And if we have time, um, I'd like to you know, answer how we can use these results to inform and encourage sustainable practices. So I have a few slides at the end for some more research, uh, recent work we've done with the Department of Energy. And so this is a really uh, great photo of what a kelp forest looks like if you went scuba diving in one on a really pristine day. I think this was taken off the coast of San Clemente Island, which is that island I showed you at the beginning of the talk. And so you can see that giant kelp um, is attached to the rocky reef below by this holdfast. And from the holdfast, it can produce tens to hundreds of fronds throughout its lifetime. And these fronds kind of look like stems and on those stems are blades or these leaf-like structures. And on each blade is a gas bladder, uh, which we call a pneumatocyst. And so that buoys these fronds up through the water column uh, to form a dense surface canopy, which is amenable to remote sensing. And what's really important here is that all of these um, fronds that buoy up create all this three-dimensional structure throughout the water column. And so you have maybe an order of magnitude more habitat that's formed when a kelp forest is present than if you just had the rocky reef alone. And a recent paper by Miller and others found that the foundational qualities of this species are mostly related to the three-dimensional structure it provides throughout the water column. And while it does provide a lot of produ production and food for some species, it, it really is the structure and, and presence of the species that provides its, the foundation. And so its presence or absence can have really immense effects on the associated kelp forest community. And there's also been some recent interest in using this fast growing biomass of this kelp um, as a feedstock for biofuels. And over the past few years, there's been a lot of increasing press about declining kelp forest systems worldwide. Um, and especially there's been a lot of press about this kind of collapse of kelp forests off the coast of Northern California. And so this decline in kelp um, north of San Francisco has been linked to an increase in sea urchins, which are an important kelp herbivore, sea star wasting disease, which has led to the mass mortality of sunflower stars, which are an important urchin predator, um, warm nutrient poor ocean conditions, and a lack of spore supply due to just a lack of kelp plants um, occupying different parts of the coast. And this decline in kelp forests in Northern California um, has had really terrible effects on both commercial and recreational fishing. So the uh, purple sea urchins, which kind of came in with a high uh, recruitment event and a lack of predators have really outcompeted the commercially fished red sea urchins. And the state has had to indefinitely close the abalone fishery. And this was one of the last places in the state where there was an abalone fishery at all. 
Um, and so this has led to, I believe, over $60 million in lost income per year uh, to this region. And because so many drivers can be implicated in the decline of this system, we really want to understand the relative importance of these extrinsic drivers on kelp dynamics across various space and time scales. So there's been much debate over the in the primary literature over the kelp over what is the primary driver of kelp forest dynamics and over the past five decades. And this debate usually centers around these three extrinsic drivers top down or the herbivory of kelp by sea urchins, the physical disturbance of kelp by large waves and bottom up forces, which um, mean, usually mean the delivery of cool nutrient rich water um, through coastal upwelling processes. And there's been several local scale studies completed along the coast of California that argue for each one of these drivers as being the main or dominant control of kelp forest dynamics at these local sites where the studies were done. And so one way to examine the relative role of these drivers is to develop spatial time series of canopy di dynamics using remote sensing. And so this image uh, was produced from drone imagery over a kelp forest uh, near Santa Barbara. And I want you to note this stream that kind of runs across the beach and into the ocean here. Um, so while we can produce this color image from this, uh, this drone sensor, we can also get information from spectral bands we cannot perceive with our eyes. And so we can use this information to make maps of sea surface temperature, um, which is shown in the red to blue colors, uh, as well as kelp canopy density, which is shown in these, in these shades of green. Um, and you can see that the water that has run over the beach and into the stream is actually much warmer than the cold ocean water and is likely formed kind of a freshwater lens um, on top of the, on top of the uh, seawater and is actually being kind of, uh, uh, captured by some of the kelp canopy there. And while we can get these very high resolution imagery um, from drones, for the work I'm about to present, we used lower spatial resolution imagery from satellites to track kelp dynamics uh, along the coast of California, because that gave us a broader geographic and temporal scope for the study. And so for this work, we use multiple Landsat satellites, which carry multispectral sensors. Um, so these sensors measure the reflectance of light across a few discrete spectral bands, like a blue, a green, a red, and a near infrared band. I've shown the near infrared band here is gray because we um, can't perceive it with our eyes. And these horizontal black lines you see across each band represent a typical reflectance spectrum for kelp canopy uh, using Landsat. So you tend to have lower reflectance in the blue and the red uh, parts of the spectrum, a bit higher reflectance in the green, and then very high reflectance in the near infrared, which we can utilize to really look, um, examine, and estimate the canopy density for each Landsat pixel. And I use the Landsat uh, sensors to develop a kelp canopy biomass time series with collaborators from uh, UC Santa Barbara and UCLA. And we calibrated three Landsat satellite sensors to track canopy, bi canopy biomass along the coast of California from 1984 to present. Um, and each Landsat sensor measures the reflectance of six or more spectral bands for every spot on earth every 16 days at a 30 by 30 meter pixel scale. So we get an image of almost every spot on earth every couple of weeks and each pixel is 30 by 30 meters on each side. So if you're familiar with baseball, that's about the size of um, the area between the bases in a baseball infield. And recently we were able to fully automate our Landsat classification protocol for um, classifying and determining the amount of canopy biomass in each pixel. And so we're using binary classification decision trees to classify each Landsat pixel is land, cloud, seawater, or kelp canopy. And so you can see one of these classified images we get from a Landsat image on the left here with kelp canopy shown as yellow. And we can then estimate the fractional cover of kelp canopy in each pixel classified as kelp and apply an empirical relationship between pixel, kelp pixel fraction and the diver measured, bi and diver measured biomass to create maps of canopy biomass. So the Santa Barbara Coastal Long-Term Ecological Research Project 
has um, completed diver-based biomass surveys at several sites in the Santa Barbara Channel, and we are able to match our Landsat pixel fraction estimates um, at the pixels over these sites and relate them through time um, to make this relationship between how much canopy is covering inside a pixel and then how much canopy biomass is there measured by the divers. And so um, by creating this uh, standardized automated protocol, we've really greatly improved the efficiency of processing this imagery. Um, it used to take us months, you know, to have a room full of undergrads manually classifying uh, each, you know, lens, a time series of Landsat image, images, but now we can do that in a, in a few hours. And then from these data, we can produce a biomass matrix of every kelp pixel along the coast of California. And so for this study, we focused on the range of dominance of giant kelp. So this is uh, the portion of California where giant kelp is the dominant canopy forming macro alga, uh, as opposed to north of San Francisco, you get bull kelp, which is a different canopy forming species. Um, and so if you, I'll explain this matrix, matrix real quick. So on the uh, X axis is time, and you can see these quarterly estimates of kelp canopy biomass at all these pixels from 1984 to 2020. And, you know, and then on the Y axis is a long shore distance. So this is uh, different parts of the coastline from the US Mexico border up to just South San Francisco, and it includes the offshore channel islands. And so if you just look at the matrix, um, you know, in the central coast of California, you see this very uh, seasonal cycle where you get very high biomass followed by very low biomass over and over and over again. But in Southern California, near the bottom of the matrix, you might see years without any kelp biomass and then several years with high kelp biomass. And we can pull slices out of that matrix and get a time series of kelp biomass for each point along the coast. And for this study, we uh, bend the coast into 500 meter coastline segments and then uh, uh, summed all the pixels within each coastline segment. And for the point to south of, Mon of the Monterey Peninsula to the north, you can see that seasonal cycle, very much a sawtooth pattern, while down by Orange County, you can see this more oscillatory pattern of, of kelp dynamics. Uh, we then use satellite sea surface temperature to derive seawater nutrient dynamics or a bottom up force, uh, coastal wave models for disturbance by waves, um, and marine climate oscillations like the El Nino Southern Oscillation and the North Pacific Gyre Oscillation to estimate the relative importance of these drivers across space using multiple linear regression. Um, and we were also able to use long-term urchin density data at about 40 sites where we had at least 20 years of observations. We weren't able, able to do it at every site because that takes a lot more work to go in and dive down and count the number of urchins along transects every year. So the first map um, I've shown on the left left here shows the dominant environmental driver for each one of these 750 sites. Um, and you can see that wave disturbance in dark blue dominates along the central coast. But as you move around Point Conception into the Southern California Bight, um, it gets a bit more complicated. You see a mix of different dominant drivers. And this variety of colors shows you know, that some sites are dominated by nitrate concentration or bottom-up forces, some by NPGO. And we also looked at harvest effort. We had a time series of of Kelco harvest, um, uh, harvest data, uh, which was a company that harvested giant kelp canopy for alginates. Um, and we can also look at the relative effect size between some of these drivers, which I think gives us a better idea of how um, the dominant driver or drivers vary across space. And because the effect of waves is almost always negative because it's disturbance, and the effect of nutrients is always, almost always positive because it drives growth and production. We can use the relative effect size to look at the gradient of control from wave disturbance in blue to nutrients in red. And we see that control by waves tends to decrease as you move south um, and switch to greater nutrient control when you get into the more wave protected Southern California bite. And we then use generalized additive models to expose the nonlinear relationships between each environmental driver um, and canopy biomass. So each uh, potential driver here has a negative effect on kelp biomass when the curve is below the zero line. 
and a positive effect on kelp biomass when it's above the zero line. And so here um, you can see that we can identify a threshold where wave height begins to be a destructive force on kelp biomass and a threshold where nutrient concentration of seawater shows a positive effect on kelp biomass. And so now I wanna take you to a kelp forest off the coast of Carpinteria, California, which is near Santa Barbara. And so you can see this salt marsh here. This was the same salt marsh, which was impacted by the mudslide. And the kelp forest offshore uh, is uh, the Carpinteria kelp forest. And in May of 2017, the Carpinteria kelp forest had very dense canopy biomass, um, which was not always the case for this, for this particular kelp forest. And so here is a time series of uh, observed kelp biomass at this site. So this is what we actually saw with the Landsat um, in the, with the Landsat time series. So you can see that this site's very dynamic, um, but that it lacked kelp canopy completely between um, 1998 and 2005. And this is following a very strong um, El Nino event we had between 1997 and 1998. So we then used the nonlinear functions I showed you on the last slide to drive a predictive model of kelp biomass based on wave height, seawater nutrients, and the phase of the North Pacific dryer oscillation. So basically, we modeled what kelp uh, that we modeled kelp dynamics based on only these physical drivers um, alone. And what's interesting is you can see a mismatch here, where uh, from 1998 to 2005. We observed no kelp canopy, but our model predicted that we would have seen um, a growth and decline of at least two um, large areas of surface canopy during this, during this period. Um, but the Santa Barbara Coastal Long-Term Ecological Research Project uh, was completing uh, urchin, sea urchin surveys during part of this mismatch period. And this time series wasn't long enough to include in our model. But when I show the urchin densities at uh, this period, you can see that when we saw these large mismatches between our model and, and what we observed, this was a period of high urchin density. And in fact, this kelp forest was an urchin barren uh, for, these, for these few years. So going back to those three dominant drivers of kelp forest dynamics, um, we see that when we arrange these citations geographically, uh, we see that urchin grazing studies would show that urchin grazing is a dominant control of kelp um, dynamics tend to have tend to be uh, at sites in Southern California. Uh, studies which show that wave disturbance was a dominant control of, of kelp dynamics tended to occur in Central California. And studies that show that nutrient availability was the dominant control of kelp um, biomass dynamics tended to occur in Southern California. And when we compare these site-based studies to the results of our analysis, we see that the spatial arrangement of the nutrient control versus wave disturbance um, is well represented. Um, we also show that urchin density can be a strong negative local force in Southern California, although um, when we looked across the coast at our 40 sites, we didn't see any negative effects of urchins in Central California. But I will note um, that this may be changing uh, because there have been reports and a recent paper that came out showing that uh, sea urchins can, are having uh, these local uh, ef negative effects on kelp forests in, in Central California, and it looks like in Northern California too. So this may just be uh, a consequence of our changing ocean, or it may just be a consequence of having longer, longer time series. But you may remember that I brought up senescence earlier in the talk. And there was a paper that came out in 2013 that showed that the senescence, this, this program senescence of fronds uh, was the main driver of kelp biomass dynamics at a couple sites in, in the Santa Barbara Channel. And this paper, uh, the authors went out to different kelp forests in the Santa Barbara Channel and they tagged fronds and they followed these different frond cohorts through time and then calculated uh, frond survivorship based on the age of the frond cohorts um, and when the, 
and how many of the fraud cohorts were lost through time. And they found a fairly predictable pattern that, you know, at about 50 or 60 days, you started to see loss of some fronds um, with a mean frond age of about 100 days. And by age, uh, frond age of 150 days, um, they were almost always gone. Um, and then this was not related to the amount of nutrients in the water. It seemed like these fronds always had this, this um, kind of set lifespan. And we wanted to look into that more. And so we wanted, we asked, how does the physiology of kelp canopy help us understand biomass dynamics across multiple scales? And to really um, observe the physiology of kelp across these scales, we have to move past the Landsat sensors and use a different type of remote sensing. Um, and we use hyperspectral imagery. And while the Landsat sensors do a great job at estimating the abundance of kelp canopy, their spectral bands, like I mentioned before, are rather coarse. And hyperspectral remote sensing breaks down the same region of the electromagnetic spectrum into many thinner bands. So you get a more, you get a contiguous and complex spectrum for each pixel. And that allows you to estimate traits like the concentration of photosynthetic pigments in the kelp canopy. And so um, you can compare those average this, or typical kelp reflectance spectrum you would see from these two sensors, where you see these four horizontal lines with the Landsat sensor, but this contiguous uh, reflectance spectrum with a hyperspectral sensor. And all those, those curves and wiggles you see in that line um, are the consequence of, of uh, spectral absorption by different photosynthetic and photoprotective pigments, which we wanted to quantify. And so uh, we're really lucky to have the Avera sensor flown um, over the Santa Barbara Channel, um, and even more lucky that it was flown multiple times per year for three years. So we're really able to get kind of a seasonal cycle of, of or potentially get a seasonal cycle of physiology of uh, canopy forming kelps in the, in the Santa Barbara Channel during this time. And so the Avera sensor is flown by Na uh, NASA and JPL and it's flown at an altitude of over 60,000 feet on a modified U-2 spy plane, so flown very high, and that's to better simulate um, what a satellite sensor would see. And this was done in preparation for a NASA-funded hyperspectral satellite sensor called Surface Biology and Geology, or SBG, which will hopefully launch in, in the mid-2020s. So we might get Landsat scale, Landsat spatial, and temporal uh, scale, so global coverage of hyperspectral imagery um, of every spot on Earth in the next few years. And so to answer this question, we collected canopy blades from three kelp forests in the Santa Barbara Channel um, every month for three years. Um, and we took these blades um, back to the lab and we extracted their photosynthetic pigments, um, quantified the pigments, and we also looked at their carbon and nitrogen content. Um, and we also measured the reflectance of each blade with a laboratory spec spectrophotometer. And so this gave us a reflectance measurements, which were similar to what we would observe with the Avarice sensor. And for this, stu for this study, we used what's called the chlorophyll to carbon ratio as our proxy for physiological condition. So we know that the surface canopy, because it's floating right at the surface, exists in a high light environment. Um, and we also know that kelp can be nutrient limited for, for several months of the year, especially during periods of warm water temperatures. And previous work using uh, small giant, giant kelp juveniles sh showed that increases in the chlorophyll A pigment were related to increased growth rates under, of kelp under high light conditions, which we would expect in the canopy. So an increase in chlorophyll to carbon ratio, an increase in growth rate. Uh, Laws and Bannister showed a linear increase in chlorophyll to carbon ratio in a marine diatom, which has very similar pigments to giant kelp, um, with increasing nutrients when they are under nutrient limited conditions. So we were confident that the chlorophyll to carbon ratio would adequately represent uh, uh, the physiological condition of the kelp canopy. And so these figures here show how the color of the blades change through time at each one of our sites. And we also, and at the bottom, we show a time series 
of chlorophyll to carbon ratio at these sites. Um, so one thing we noticed is that the color of the canopy blades changed seasonally and also between years. So back in 2013, we noticed you know, fairly dark blades throughout almost the entire year. While in 2014, when he, we had a marine heat wave, in 2015, when we, saw the, when we had the strong El Nino event, we saw much lighter color blades. But you can see even in these periods of the, the blob and the marine heat wave, there were seasonal changes where we saw some high physiological condition blades during certain times of the year, which tended to, to coincide with, with nutrient upwelling. So we then developed an algorithm to estimate chlorophyll to carbon ratio from reflectance. So we found that the spectral slope associated with the width of the chlorophyll A absorption peak produced robust estimates of chlorophyll to carbon ratio. So if you look at this figure on the left, these three uh, colored spectrum here, spectra show, the, show three typical um, reflectance spectra of the kelp canopy with different physiological conditions. And if you zoom into the inset here, um, we focused on these two spectral bands, one at about 668 nanometers and one at about 658 nanometers. And as the physiological condition increases, there's more chlorophyll pigment in the blade tissue. And that widens that chlorophyll A absorption peak, which you can kind of see as this valley here. And that decreases the slope between the two bands. And so we use that um, as our as our spectral uh, algorithm um, for to detect chlorophyll to carbon ratio from the blades. Um, and in laboratory settings, um, we found that we can estimate chlorophyll to carbon ratio reliably using reflectance. So we then applied this laboratory derived algorithm to the avarice hyperspectral imagery um, at kelp forests over our sample sites. And we compared our remotely sensed chlorophyll to carbon ratio estimates in the pixels um, which overlaid our sample plots uh, to the chlorophyll to carbon ratio of the blades we collected in the field at the same time the imagery uh, uh, was acquired. And um, to our delight, we found that the algorithm does a good job at estimating the physiological condition of the surface canopy from the hyperspectral imagery. So at this point, we were confident to apply this algorithm to all of the hyperspectral imagery across the Santa Barbara Channel. And we were then able to see if the extrinsic drivers were related to the regional patterns of chlorophyll to carbon ratio um, across our study region, which is the Santa Barbara Channel shown in this Landsat image here. And the Santa Barbara Channel is an excellent place to ask this question because it contains water masses that resemble the cold nutrient rich waters off central California and the warmer, less nutrient rich waters of Southern California. And a really, um, uh, a really, uh, a, a real temperature gradient can set up across the channel, especially in the spring and summer. And you can kind of see it here in this, in this Landsat image of sea surface temperature, where we have this cold nutrient rich water um, coming from the central coast of California, coming into the western part of the channel, and then this warm, more nutrient poor water coming in to the eastern part of the channel. And since this is an upwelling system, there's a strong inverse and nonlinear relationship between temperature and nitrate. And uh, we can turn sea surface temperature imagery into surface nitrate concentration. Um, using these uh, nonlinear relationships, um, which we derived from satellite imagery um, and extensive uh, seawater sampling of the Southern California Bite. And so let me orient you to this map of the Santa Barbara Channel in June of 2014. So sea surface temperature is shown from blue to white. Uh, and represents the mean sea surface temperature of the 16 days prior to our kelp chlorophyll to carbon ratio estimates. And so we know that kelp, uh, the physiological condition of kelp is not going to respond instantaneously to inputs of nutrients. It's going to take uh, several days and be integrated across time. So we wanted to look at uh, you know, the amount of nutrients in the water and the temperature of the water for several days before the imagery was acquired. 
And the colors along the coast in this kind of copper color scheme are the main chlorophyll to carbon ratio um, for all pixels within one kilometer chunks of coastline, which contain kelp canopy. And so in June, we found that canopy with higher chlorophyll to carbon ratio and higher physiological condition is mostly seen in the western part of the channel and out on the channel islands and is associated with this cooler, more nutrient-rich surface waters, while canopy with lower physiological condition was out here in the Eastern Channel and tended to be associated with warmer, uh, less nutrient-rich uh, surface waters. And we were, like I said before, we were lucky enough to get eight images, hyperspectral images over the course of three years um, of the Santa Barbara Channel and all the kelp forests. So, we can then take these relationships across all of these eight images together, um, where each colored line represents an image date. And so, so this basically, should, each colored line represents a linear relationship between sea surface temperature and chlorophyll to carbon ratio. And you tend to see these, this negative relationship. Um, but you tend to not to see a, a relationship when the water was kind of uniformly cold, uh, nutrient rich across the entire uh, across the entire channel, or when in August, when the entire channel was very warm and nutrient poor. And the mean relationship shown here as uh, the black and gray line uh, shows the nonlinear decrease in chlorophyll to carbon ratio as temperature moves from about 14 degrees to 19 degrees. And if you remember from a couple of slides before, there's the nonlinear relationship between sea, sea surface temperature and nitrate concentration, where when you get, when sea surface temperature is warmer than about 14 degrees, it uh, starts to lose uh, nutrient, it starts to lose the, the con it starts to decrease the amount of, of nitrate uh, in, the, in the waters um, to where it's not really detectable um, at temperatures above, 18 or 19 degrees. And when we convert sea surface temperature to sea, seawater nitrate using the empirical relationship I showed earlier, we see a strong response of chlorophyll to carbon ratio to nitrate concentrations between about 0.1 and one micromolar nitrate. And in fact, when we compare this relationship with previous studies, which measured frond growth rates in seawater nitrate, we see a similar pattern in that nitrate concentration of about uh, one micromolar was associated with maximum frond elongation rate. So this is strong evidence that the nutrient conditions of the Santa Barbara Channel are influencing the regional patterns of kelp physio physiological condition and growth. So from looking at Landsat observations of kelp for many years, probably too many years, um, we know that local scale kelp forest dynamics are very complex. And so here I'm showing you a year of kelp forest biomass dynamics at the native 30 meter resolution of Landsat. And at the top, you can see seawater nitrate is shown in the red line and the black bars show the maximum significant wave height uh, for each day. And waves with wave heights known to cause disturbance for giant kelp marked with these asterisks here. And so kelp canopy biomass tends to increase uh, through the spring and summer, which you can see right now, and then begins to decline when nitrate levels decrease in the late summer. However, we see these declines from the inshore area first uh, towards, towards the offshore area. I'd like to let that play one more time. And so this always kind of puzzled us why this was happening because we didn't see any large wave events occurring at that time that would um, remove kelp in this spatial pattern. And so we wanted to examine um, any local patterns in physiological condition within a single kelp forest and see if these patterns were consistent with kelp growth rate um, and kelp decline. And so for this question, I'm going to focus on a large kelp bed just south of the of Point Conception in the Western Santa Barbara Channel. And we call this kelp forest the Coho Kelp Forest because it's in this kind of Coho anchorage area. And it's a rather large kelp forest. It um, can be up to a couple kilometers across. And so here's a five month time series of canopy chlorophyll to carbon ratio across three hyperspectral image dates in 2015. And the black contour lines behind each one of these dates show um, the bathymetry of this site. And so from our 
uh, Landsat observations, which we can get at least one good image a month, uh, we know that this site had no kelp canopy in January and February. So it's kind of starting from a clean slate. Um, in March and April, we began to saw, see canopy development with maximum canopy development in June. Uh, we then found some canopy loss in, in August, and by October, there was no kelp canopy at the site whatsoever. And so overall, if you were to take the mean across all of these 18 meter pixels at each one of these uh, different months, you would see basically the same seasonal pattern we observed at the one kilometer scale, where you know during the April upwelling season, we tend to see high chlorophyll to carbon ratio. In June, if you took the mean, it would be slightly reduced from April. And then August, it would be very low physiological condition. But what's really interesting here is if you look at the June image alone, um, the range of chlorophyll to carbon ratio across the single kelp forest equaled the range uh, we saw regionally across the entire Santa Barbara Channel. So parts of the forest had really high physiological condition and parts of the forest had really low physiological condition. So this implied that there was some local scale controls that weren't driven by the regional nutrient uh, differences we saw across the channel. And there's been several previous studies which have, shown, which have looked for changes in nutrients across a bed of this size, and they haven't really found much evidence for it in this region because seawater um, moves through the kelp forest rather quickly. Um, however, we do know that blade color changes with age. And so here is uh, our two kelp blades, one that I, that I collected um, in, you know, a few weeks after it matured. So it's probably about four weeks old here. And you can see that it's dark and has a lot of pigment. Um, and the other one is after that blade starts to senesce. So we tend to see a much lighter color um, and some degradation around the edges. And so in order to investigate the effect of canopy age on physiological condition, we use the Landsat sensors to create a time series of canopy development for our sites. And since we had two active Landsat sensors in 2015, we're able to get an image of the kelp forest every eight days, as long as there was no cloud cover. And so here on the left, you're seeing uh, the age of the canopy. And this is using the date where the canopy was first observed. So when, remember in June or in uh, January and February, we saw no canopy. And then once we saw a canopy click on as, as, once we saw a pixel click on as kelp canopy, we said that was day one. And then we followed that pixel through time to make this map of, of age. And this is, age on June 19th of 2015. Um, and when you compare these images, older parts of the canopy or areas where the canopy emerged earlier in the season tended to have lower physiological condition. Oops. And when you look at all the dates, um, across all these three dates in 2015, you can kind of see the same trend. So in April, there was mostly young canopy with a uniformly high physiological condition. In June, there's a mix of canopy ages and variable chlorophyll to carbon ratio. And by August, the remaining canopy had been on for about 100 days and chlorophyll to carbon ratio was uniformly low. And you could see that these areas of lower physiological condition in June kind of presage the loss of canopy in the August image. So these areas that had higher physiological condition in June, and note they go around the whole um, kelp forest, even in the shallow areas, tended uh, to stick around through August, even though all canopy was lost by October. And when we plot canopy age, which we derived from Landsat, against the chlorophyll to carbon ratio, which we derived from the hyperspectral imagery, we get this nonlinear relationship where we tend to see uh, chlorophyll to carbon ratio stay relatively constant for about 40 or 50 days, and then a rapid decline um, in physiological condition down to about 100 days. And then here again is that plot of frond survivorship from the Rodriguez et al. study in, in 2013. And you can see that both of these follow this theoretical pattern expected from a senescing population where there's a rapid and nonlinear decline at a specific age. And when you plot, um, when you take the mean relationship from the Rod Rodriguez study in blue and you take its derivative, you can find uh, the rate of frond loss. And we plot this empirical frond loss rate in red against the decline in canopy 
uh, chlorophyll to carbon ratio with canopy age in, in gray and black. And you see that the rate of frond loss increases as physiological condition decreases and reaches a maximum frond loss rate when physiological conditions, condition reaches its minimum around that 100 day mark, which is also the mean age, the mean uh, survivorship age of fronds in the kelp forest. And so this is strong evidence that local physiological condition patterns and frond loss is driven by these intrinsic senescence patterns. And you know, whenever you see something from a, high, from an, a remote sensing image, uh, some cool pattern, um, you know, you tend to be a bit skeptical about it. So we went back into the field afterwards to see if we can confirm this, this uh, loss in chlorophyll pigment with age. And so we went out to kelp forests in the Santa Barbara Channel. We tagged kelp fronds in canopy every two weeks. We went and tagged another 100 kelp fronds, uh, sample the blade near the tag, and then every two weeks go tag more and then find the ones that we tagged before sample blades. So we knew how old those blades were, took them back to the lab, and we confirmed um, that there is a predictable decline in chlorophyll to carbon ratio, especially when you account for um, changes to the seawater nutrients, um, uh, the seasonal changes in, in upwelling. Okay, so what did we learn from this overall study. Um, we detected different controlling processes at different spatial scales of observation, um, with each driver affecting kelp dynamics. So regional uh, physiological condition was associated with spatial temporal patterns in sea surface temperature, and by extension, ambient seawater nitrate. Uh, and local chlorophyll to carbon ratio was associated with canopy frond demographics and senescence. So what drives the dynamics of coastal ecosystems. So with this knowledge, um, we're able to reconcile competing theories of the primary extrinsic drivers of kelp dynamics. Um, and we found that the strength of these extrinsic drivers varies across space and time. Um, and we also found that this dominant driver can shift through time. So, you know, early in carpentry at the carpentry at kelp forest early on, there may have been more, uh, the dominant driver may have been waves during certain seasons or for certain periods of time nutrients during these low frequency marine climate oscillations. However, for a period of time between 1998 and 2005, um, it looks like urchin or bivory was the dominant control of the system. We also discovered that there's different controlling processes within the same site, depending on the spatial scale of observation. So where physiological condition was associated with nutrients at the one kilometer spatial scale um, and senescence processes at the 10 meter spatial scale. And so we have to think about how, at what spatial scale is best to observe a system um, uh, to, to understand what is the main driver of dynamics at that system. And so this is just a couple more slides to show how we can use these results to inform uh, and encourage sustainable practices. So recently, um, we were funded by the Department of Energy to develop an autonomous and scalable system for monitoring the underwater and canopy portions of kelp in offshore aquaculture farms, which don't exist yet. Um, so this research was motivated by these recent advances to use kelp biomass as a, as a feedstock to produce ethanol where using kelp biomass is about twice as efficient as using, as using corn. Um, it also requires no additional fertilizer, no fresh water, um, and would free up arable land for food production. And so the thought was to kind of put the pieces, um, the research components for monitoring and modeling uh, and, and farm design um, out there to allow a market to develop, to build these kind of offshore farms um, away from the coast. And so the beginning of the project, we used a drone mounted hyperspectral sensor to measure kelp physiology. So in this case, it's, it's tissue nitrogen content um, at the frond scale. And we used natural kelp forest systems as our proxy because these aquaculture farms which form canopy didn't exist in the Santa Barbara Channel at that time. So in the top right, you can see a color image of a kelp forest acquired from a consumer color camera drone. And then below is that same kelp forest where tissue nitrogen content has been estimated from the hyperspectral imagery at about a 25 centimeter scale. 
Um, and we used a laboratory algorithm we, we built from spectral measurements, uh, kind of similar to what I showed before. And you can see that these lighter colored fronds in the top figure tend to correspond to fronds that have a lower tissue nitrogen content. Um, however, this hyperspectral imager uh, is fairly difficult to use and processing the imagery takes a fair amount of knowledge and effort. So while it's a really, it's an excellent research tool, it may not be the best system for a farm manager to use to monitor an aquaculture farm. We wouldn't expect someone who um, has an offshore aquaculture farm to be an expert in hyperspectral remote sensing. So um, luckily for us, the drone sensor market is really rapidly evolving and recently we were able to transition to this 10 band multispectral sensor system. Um, and so you can see the 10 lenses there, you get a, a, an image of each uh, spectral band, which then you can stack on each other, right? And we can mosaic all of these images together to produce a large image of the entire kelp forest at a pixel resolution of about nine or 10 centimeters. And so here I'm showing a color image we made from these uh, drone images uh, at the Arroyo Camado kelp forest in March of 2021. And these plots show the reflectance of three individual kelp canopy pixels with different concentrations of the chlorophyll pigment. And so with this 10 band sensor, you can see we can get to this spectral slope coming out of the, of the chlorophyll A absorption peak. And uh, so from this image, we're able to take the different spectral bands and make maps of both biomass density and chlorophyll concentration. Um, and so all of the algorithms are based on laboratory derived uh, measurements. So we're currently completing field validation to be able to put units on these, uh, on these different plots. Um, but what's really cool is that since all of the imagery is, is co-registered in space, um, we're able to overlay the image products and create images like the one we show here, where we go from a color image to an image of physiological condition or chlorophyll uh, concentration to biomass. And so this is something that can be done with one flight um, by a farm manager of the, of the of kelp forest canopy. And so we're working on models to estimate crop production, sugar content, and risk of crop loss due to the senescence of fronds. And so this just shows a way we can take um, this kind of fundamental or basic research I presented earlier and, and transition it to more applied or use-inspired use um, research. And I'd like to thank all my collaborators for the work that I presented today. Um, and of course, the multiple funding agencies which funded this. And I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Outstanding. Thank you very much. I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Yes, clapping. Sure. Remote clapping is tough. Thank you. Tom, that was outstanding. I'm going to open it up to questions, but because we only have about seven minutes, I would mm -hmm. ask Tom, if you're comfortable, I'm going to put you on the spot. Would you put your email address in the chat for those sure. who we, we may not get to? Uh, yep. They could contact you by email. Um, and also, if you have uh, any questions, let's, let's kick it off. Who's first? I have some, but I don't want to do all the talking. <laughs> I, I had a question, um, which might might be a quick one, but I was curious about, um, so I'm, I'm a forest ecologist, I don't really work in marine systems, but I was curious about senescence and the his like, was your result about senescence, is it is senescence like a well known established process in kelp forests that, um, you know, are, are, are people pretty settled that that's something that that kelp does, um, or is that sort of a controversial topic. Well, um, I mean, if you spent time in a kelp forest, you'll know that you can see different fronds and different fronds or some are vigorously growing and some are kind of looking old and degrading. And, and uh -huh. if, you, if you go out there enough, you'll see certain times of the year, you see a, everything looks great and certain times of the year, things start falling apart. Uh -huh. um, really the Rodriguez study was the only one that really quantified it though to show that there's some sort of process that's kind of regulating it. But if mm -hmm. you talk to kelp researchers, they'll say, oh yeah, we've seen these weird patterns where kelp forests you know, grow up. And then even though there's nutrients in the water, a lot of it just kind of collapses all at once. And so uh -huh. that was something we were kind of interested in. I mean, when I first saw that large kelp forest of those patterns, I emailed uh, David Thompson at JPL and I was like, 
what went wrong with this image, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was like, I, I don't know, could be like coastal aerosols, you know? And then that really kind of motivated because really we were just, you know, looking to see whether we can see these, you know, regional scale um, mm -hmm. drivers from nutrients. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So yeah. anecdotally consistent. Yeah. And we were able to kind of take some of this knowledge and apply it back in time to the Landsat imagery too. And so having an idea that these can occur, that this process can occur over these scales, we were able to look back at Landsat imagery, you know, back to the nineties and see this pattern kind of pop uh -huh. up where we have, pure, you know, parts of, of forest come up earlier and then they decline earlier than a, even though the environmental conditions should be relatively constant across the mm -hmm. area. It's really interesting. I see. Awesome. I see two hands. I'll do Dave and then Nick. Yeah, um, I was just wondering, do you, the reflectance that you're using, is that water leaving reflectance or are you making some corrections for the water column the optical properties of the water column. No, we're just we're just using the so this is you know level two reflectance. Um, we're because the canopy is sitting right at the surface. We're just using the reflectance that we're measuring from the sensor. Um, we do make not a correction to reflectance, but we because we can also use our methods which I showed earlier to get to abundance we can um, you know, focus in on pixels where we know that, that have a lot of kelp that, you know, so we can calculate the proportion of seawater, the proportion of kelp in a pixel. So we can say, okay, we're only interested in pixels that contain at least 10% of kelp canopy. So we know we're not biasing too much on just a few strands of kelp canopy in a, in a mostly seawater pixel. Okay, great, thanks. Sure. Uh, Nick. Um, so I'm just kind of curious how the depth of the water here affects your estimates of biomass of the kelp. Yeah, so the biomass is canopy biomass. So um, we can kind of model what the entire biomass is of the under, at least the parts of the canopy that are attached to, the parts of the biomass of the plant that are attached to the canopy that go down to the reef. Hmm. Um, but we had a paper a couple of years ago that looked at the influence of tides and currents on how much kelp canopy we can see. And we looked at, you know, what's interesting is that uh, depending on the Landsat tile, we were, we were first interested to see whether Landsat 7 was giving us higher or lower biomass estimates than Landsat 8. And we found that in some cases, Landsat 7 was giving us higher, but some cases Landsat 8 was giving us higher biomass depending on where the Landsat tile was. And it, we kind of banged our head against our desk for a couple of weeks trying to figure this out, going back through our original atmospheric corrections. Um, but we found out that the eight day, the 16 day repeat period of Landsat can link up with tides, the tidal cycle during a period of a couple of years. And so if you were at a tile um, where Landsat 7 was always at a lower tide than Landsat 8, Landsat 7 would look like it was greater. And some tiles, they were at about equal tide. So um, what we do, we did make a tidal correction, but we we're worried about losing pixels on the edge. So we, uh, we basically serve it as a seasonal biomass estimate and we use multiple Landsat images within a season uh, to get to that. We actually have a paper uh, which we're submitting soon where we had, we use drones, just color camera drones to uh, fly simultaneous Landsat overpasses for four years. And so we can look at how at a pixel scale, Landsat's actually observing the amount of can like the canopy area versus canopy biomass, and then how these local like currents along the outer edge may be dragging down kelp. Any other hands? Greg, JD, or can I ask a quick question? So Tom, uh, really great talk, and I missed your first five minutes or so. So I work with drones. I spent many years at Monterey Bay. Uh, cool. so not so much a center. So I am looking at this photo, and I know you mentioned using hyperspectral camera. We actually use the microsense uh, cameras as well. We just got mm -hmm. a laptop recently, so it has thermal, but not the ten band one. What yeah. could you learn from an underwater drone that can image this kelp as like we image trees in a farm, or uh, like would you gain some knowledge? I ma imagine that there are things you cannot see, but is it important? Like if you could do a 3D map of the kelp as we are seeing in this photo you have here. Yes, yeah. So as part of the RPE project, we have underwater, you know, 
uh, unoccupied underwater vehicles. They're kind of like micro AUVs that we have um, color cameras and side scan sonar. So we can quantify the, the those pneumatics make a really great acoustic target. And because there, there's one for every blade, there's a real great relationship between biomass and, and acoustic returns. So we're using that uh, side scan to get at, at, under, at understory biomass. And then the color cameras, this is specifically for kelp farms, to image the, the, out, the small outplants along the lines. And we're using um, uh, deep learning to just classify the, the right. kelp versus the line versus tags. And that seems to be working really well. Got it. Now imagine that what you cannot do, again, this is not at all, even plants are not my area of expertise, but I imagine you cannot do things like NDVI underwater. But no, there... it, yeah. I mean, there's, there's, I've heard of some, I've talked to a company the other day that was saying they were doing hyperspectral remote sensing with AUVs. And it, it I mean, it, I, I did some work out in Hawaii during the Avarice campaign in 2017, and we took a lot of underwater, we did a lot of underwater spectroscopy with um, kind of handheld uh, spectrometers and, you know, having that reflectance target at a known distance away, uh, you know, we basically kept our spectral line panel on a PVC pipe attached so we can take a target, move it out of the way, get a, get an estimate of, of the coral reflectance or the sand reflectance or algae reflectance. So, yeah, I mean, you know, light's going to do interesting things, things underwater. So, and you lose different wavelengths at different, at different amounts. So, It'd be tough. I'm Thank gonna you. I'm gonna cut it off only because it's the top of the hour and people need to jet. Um, please, Tom. Thank you. First of all, Tom. Thank you again. Sure. Uh, really, that was outstanding. Great end to our seminar series for the for the spring. Really appreciate it. And please, everyone, uh, feel comfortable uh, emailing to me and or Tom if you want to get in touch with him and do follow up. I have like a thousand questions, so I'll probably do, do an email to you, Tom. Thank you again. Good. Awesome. Cool. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Okay. That was fun. Take care.